or questions or sort of the yes but, you know, it can't possibly work this way. And those are wonderful questions. Those are exactly the questions that the Buddha said, please ask those. Um, he said, don't take anything that I'm saying um, on, you know, on face value. Don't take it because, you know, t don't take it as a rule. Um, really let yourself hear it. Okay, fine. And then reflect on it. Reflect on it with respect to your own life and your own experience. What works? What doesn't work? What what makes sense? What really just seems caca and wrong? And so um, I wanted you, uh, among other things, there may be another way that we'll use those papers, but I wanted you to have a piece of paper that you could write um, whatever kind of observations or challenges or, or questions that you might have. And then you'll give them to me, hopefully, at the end. And, um, and then I'll be able to kind of incorporate them into our, in, into our uh, offerings over the, the, the space of time to kind of ideally over this period of time to have us kind of explore together our understanding of conflict and the end of conflict and to really bring to bear in a hopefully very practical way um, some of the teachings that can help us really inquire into how to have more ease uh, in our lives. So I have a definition of conflict, but probably we mostly don't need it, do we? You know, most of us kind of know about disagreement, incompatibility, opposition, to fight or contend to do battle, prolonged struggle, controversy or quarrel, a fight, a battle, we, we know about these things. At least I do. I don't know about you guys. Um, and so how do we, you know, how do we, how do we be with, with this? Um, my, my talk tonight and the series is actually informed by a couple things. One is this, the committee, this group of people who are working together with, um, about uh, working with uh, understanding conflict and, and how to work with conflict in our community. And uh, the other uh, was, I was inspired by Christina's talk a couple weeks ago. Um, she reflected, she read a reflection that was reflecting on the gratitude for this human life, and in particular, grief for the losses of war, and turning in the direction of a more just and peaceful world. And Christina read a sutta that spoke of the sharp pointed knives in the hearts of people and our practice is one of recognizing these knives and extracting them from our hearts and through this working toward the end of suffering. So it's like, you know, working with these knives, it was um, in the suttas, like the knives in our hearts. I thought it might be helpful to explore that a little bit, to kind of inquire into the knives in our hearts. Christina was speaking of war, and she did the talk on Memorial Day, and um, you know all of the uh, kind of strife in our world. And I don't know about you, but there's a tendency for me to think of the Buddhist time as um, just different. You know, well, you know, easy for him to say about you know hatred never ceases by hatred, but he didn't have to deal with this crap that we're you know, that we're dealing with every day. He really, you know, it was just a much sweeter, simpler time. People were nicer to each other. Um, but actually, you know, it kind of wasn't true. I want to read to you a couple of things. Um, this is in part, uh, this is from one of the suttas that Christina read, um, where the Buddha says, I want to talk with you about the issue of suffering and tell you how I was how I was able to let go of fear. He says, people in the world experience one suffering after another, like a fish living in a pond that is drying up day by day. Hmm. In a situation of suffering, violent thoughts easily arise, and people in their ignorance seek to relieve their suffering by terrorizing and punishing others. The sutta goes on, the whole world is burning with violence. In the ten directions, all is chaos. There is not a place where there is real peace and security. 
Everyone sees himself as superior to others. Few people know to let go of passions. Not having seen this reality, people continue to hold hatred and ignorance in their hearts. This was a description of the Buddha's time from Bhikkhu Bodhi, where he says the world was undergoing sweeping transformations that profoundly reshaped the region's geopolitics. The older tribal states were giving way to states ruled by ambitious kings who competed for dominance, leaving behind trails of blood and tears. And again, we kind of think, well, does any of this sound familiar? This is directly from the Sutta, the, the Suttas. The Buddha is, this is a couple of Suttas, where the Buddha is talking about his own times, where he talks about men taking swords and shields and buckling on bows and quivers, charging into battle, massed in double array while arrows and spears are flying and swords are flashing. And there they are, wounded by arrows and spears, and their heads are cut off by swords so that they incur death or deadly pain. That's one of the suttas where the Buddha is teaching. We read of, in another sutta, rulers obsessed by lust for power who executed their rivals, imprisoning them, confiscating their property and condemning them to exile. Hmm. Sounds kind of familiar, doesn't it? One of the things that struck me about the, um, when we were uh, thinking the last time about the knives, the sharp, the sharp pointed knives in the hearts, is just how easy it is to think about um, these sharp pointed knives kind of out there. And you might even track your own thinking as I've been speaking, you know. Where geographically have you located your thoughts? You know, is it in Southeast Asia someplace, or in the Middle East, or in Congress? Um, you know, that we have a tendency to think that those people out there should do better. Do you ever read the newspaper thinking that? You know, those, those people should do better. You know, it's like, what's wrong with them? Um, they really should do better. And so there's this tendency to kind of move in our minds, sort of out there into the abstract. But the Buddhist teaching is actually quite a lot more specific than that. He's inviting us to um, really bring attention to the sharp, pointed knives in our own hearts. The Sutta actually goes on specifically to name it that way. He talks about the sharp pointed knives of greed and of hatred and of ignorance that arise in our own hearts and minds and that our practice, he says, the end of suffering, is the working in our own being with these sharp pointed knives. So we can kind of really begin to kind of feel that challenge and that sometimes it's a little challenging to really bring that awareness back home uh, to those places where um, we have the sharp pointed knives in our own hearts. Here's a quote from Alexander Solzhenitsyn, uh, the Russian novelist. He says, if only it were all so simple, if only there were evil people somewhere insidiously committing evil deeds, and it were necessary only to separate them from the rest of us and destroy them. But the line dividing good and evil cuts through the heart of every human being, and who is willing to destroy a piece of his own heart? And Alexander Solzhenitsyn really knew uh, whereof he spoke because he was very severely persecuted uh, by the Russian state during his lifetime. 
and says, if only it were so simple. If only all we had to do was send out enough drones, you know, and knock those suckers off, you know, then life would be fine. But the Buddha's teaching actually turns that right on its head. He said, don't go there. Don't go there. Look at the knives in our own hearts and minds. Work with it there. That's the origin of conflict resolution. It's the origin of conflict, and it's the origin of conflict resolution. This, I'll go on with the the rest of the sutta. Um, Binding themselves in those states of mind, the sharp-pointed knives, they bring themselves more misunderstanding and suffering. He says, I have looked deeply into the states of mind of unhappy people, and I have seen hidden under their suffering a very sharp-pointed knife. Because they don't see that sharp pointed knife in themselves, it is difficult for them to deal with suffering. And here he means it's difficult to deal with our own suffering. The pain caused by the sharp pointed knife lasts a long time and does not change. Because they continue holding on to the knife like that, they fill the world with suffering. They continue holding on to the knife like that. They fill the world with suffering. Only when they have the opportunity to recognize it and extract it from their hearts will the suffering cease. And only then will they have the chance to stop, to stop uh, causing suffering and to stop experiencing suffering. So I wanted to pause here, um, and if you want, you can use that piece of paper. Um, the Buddha invites us in to, to kind of work with the teachings in three ways, and I often reference them. The first way is just hearing, and sort of hearing, does this sort of sound right? You know, Does it make sense? And then the second layer is reflecting, really looking to see, how does this work in our own life? And then the third layer is really, it's only in the third layer that it's through a meditation practice that we're looking in a very refined way into how this works. So I'm going to invite you into that second layer for just a moment and to contemplate any sense of conflict or sharp pointed knife that has arisen for you today. And I'm going to invite you to contemplate, just reflect, and you can write them down if you want to, and if you don't want to, that's fine. Um, But to reflect in three areas. One is some kind of, um, uh, I'll I'll call it silly, mundane area. You know, the thing where, you know, your partner leaves the, the cereal bowl in the sink instead of washing it, or, you know, those places where, Um, They're just sort of like little things that really are just not, they don't really matter much, but they're like these little pinpricks of sharp pointed knives. You know, that person who cut you off in traffic or the, you know, the person I was in the grocery store today and was really in a hurry and somebody made it very obvious that she was ahead of me in line, you know. You know, those places where we just see these little These little knives come up. So to just reflect for a moment, just some mundane place today. The second place that you might reflect is about something that's more abstract. Here's where the world comes in, you know, where we kind of think about the sharp pointed knives that I feel with respect to something in the world. So, for example, it might be um, some politician or something in the news or some policy, um, governmental policy, that we find ourselves responding to with a sharp pointed knife. You know, but it's kind of out there. It isn't like we're really kind of thinking I'm going to like take this on and do something about it. But when we think about it, we can really feel the arising of that sharp-pointed knife. 
So that one. And then the third area that you might contemplate, and then I'll just pause for a minute and let you, let you reflect, is something that's more chronic. You know, that um, sibling that you don't get along with or the um, mother-in-law, or the, mm, you know, you know, <laughs> you know. That thing that's more chronic that really um, is hard to let go of. You know, that thing your father did when you were six, or that teacher, that fourth grade teacher. I'll just reflect on the arising of these sharp pointed knives. No judgment. That's another sharp pointed knife. The ways that we turn those knives of judgment and conflict uh, against ourselves. So the invitation is an invitation of awareness Letting go of judgment. Can it simply be known? And can it simply be known really here where it arises? This is dukkha. This is suffering. Lucky for us, the Buddha speaks of knowing dukkha, knowing the cause, knowing the end of suffering. How do we get from knowing suffering to the end of suffering? Okay? But in order to do that, we have to first know and really experience, ah, the sharp-pointed knife. So the Buddha uses this metaphor of sharp-pointed knives, and as I've read in the Sutta, he invites us to cultivate the capacity to extract these sharp-pointed knives from our own minds and hearts. And it isn't like, you know, we kind of go home and we say, okay, fine, I'll just do that. Um, But we cultivate the training, if you will, the mind training, the practice over time, over and over again, knowing them and cultivating the skills. And he's referring to the arrows of greed, of hatred, and of ignorance. So can we release these arrows, release these knives in our own hearts? For tonight, I wanted to focus especially on ignorance. Ignorance is this kind of funky thing, you know. It's like, how do we, how do we know ignorance? Because if we're ignorant, we don't even know we're ignorant. You know, it's just, you know, so it's just we kind of trot along and carry on and what do we, what do we know? I wanted to tell you a story about ignorance, um, which I think is a kind of good example and it's from when I was 10. I really don't have to go quite that far back, but I thought it was a sweet story, so I'll tell you. Because it's such a wonderful story about ignorance. When I was 10 years old, I was home without my siblings one day And I was a little bored, and I decided to um, bring out my brother's brand new Monopoly game, which um, I believe I wasn't supposed to be doing. I think there was a rule about that someplace. So I sat on the front porch with my orange popsicle and was playing with the Monopoly game, and you know what happened. Um, And, you know, so I'm sort of leaning over it, and my little orange popsicle just dripped onto right in the middle of this pristine Monopoly game that I wasn't supposed to be playing with. And I thought, okay, now here's a problem, you know. Here's a problem. Nobody's home. I have to, like, solve this problem before anybody gets home. And so I went into the kitchen, and I um, got a little um, can of Ajax cleanser. <laughs> and I took it out to the front porch and I proceeded to um, scrub the little spot of popsicle dropping 
with Ajax Cleanser. Isn't that a wonderful story about <laughs> ignorance? You know, just ignorance. We don't understand. We just, we don't understand how things work. And so the Buddha says, I get it. I, you know, I've meditated. I've done all these practices. I see how things work. But ignorance is when we don't understand how things work and we keep trying to solve the problem of sharp pointed knives um, without understanding it. So for example, if we didn't understand about the sharp pointed knives of war, we would go home and we would very self-righteously think that those people, those assholes, those jerks, those fools, those terrible people should do something different and I'm just like sending out all the little sharp pointed knives, you know, and really contributing to suffering in, in my ignorance, not even understanding that I'm even doing that. Um, uh, so many ways that we don't understand. Um, I... Um, I actually um, had a phone call the other day from, maybe you, maybe you got them, I got a phone call from the Democratic National Committee who were asking me for um, donations. And almost before they could say much of anything, the woman made some snarky comment, and I can't even remember it, which is probably good because I don't think it or repeating, but there was a comment about how we have to get together, you know, because something, something, something about Paul Ryan, you know, in, in implying that Paul Ryan was a jerk and a fool, and you know, we had to, we had to stop these people. And I stopped her right there, you know, because it's sort of like, you know, it's this place where, you know, we can really in ignorance, just kind of jump on the bandwagon of creating a us and a them and a right and a wrong and an up and a down and really creating and sustaining rancor and conflict. Uh, not really what we're about in our spiritual practice. Um, we tend to think that the way I think about things, the title of my talk is actually, if you looked it up on the, on the web, the title of my talk is, But I'm Right and You're Wrong. Uh, so this ignorance that kind of guides that position um, and how do, we, how do we work with that? And right here I want to just remind you that you have a piece of paper to ask questions. Because when we get into this territory, there really can be a lot of questions. Well, how do you, you know, how do you work with this stuff? Um, so really feel free to challenge it and to write questions and to help me kind of guide some of the teaching over these weeks. But I wanted to um, reference um, the sutta on the blind men and the elephant. And I actually never knew that that story of the blind men and the elephant came out of the Pali Canon. It actually was a, a story that the Buddha told. Um, and apparently it was a true story about a king in um, Savati. And the king uh, told his uh, householder, he said, um, you know, kind of, I'm a little bored here. So what I'd like you to do is I'd like you to go find a whole bunch of uh, men who have been blind from birth and bring them to the courtyard. And he had uh, placed in the courtyard one of his elephants. And he had the, um, his, his uh, assistants, whatever, he said, um, he says, very well then, show the blind people an elephant Responding, as you say, your majesty, to the king, the assistant showed the blind people an elephant. To some of the blind people, he showed the elephant's head, saying, this blind people is what an elephant is like. To some of them, he showed the elephant's ear, saying, this blind people is what an elephant is like. To some of them, he showed the elephant's tusk, the trunk, the body, the foot, 
the hindquarters, the tail, the tuft at the end of the tail, saying, this blind people is what an elephant is like. And I'm going to propose to us all that this is really akin to how we are raised in our families, in our schools, in our religions, in our political communities, in our cultures, in our tribes, in our clans, uh, in our countries. This blind people is what an elephant is like. It's constructed. Uh, it's taught. This blind people is what it's like. This is what you believe. This is what is true. And then, um, having shown the blind people the elephant, the man went to the king and said, okay, now what? Now what should we do? Um, and so he said, so the king said, okay, to each of them, he said, you know, tell me what, a, what an elephant is like. It'd be like Ben. Tell me what, you know, what's an elephant like? Or Billy, what, you know, what's an elephant like? Or Eileen, you know, what's, what's your view of what an elephant is like? And Michael, what's your view of what an elephant is like? And Ma Maggie, what's, you know, so, he, he, you know, he had, and then people started, you know, as they're speaking, um, they started fighting with one another. He said, no, 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 it's not like that. It's really, it's fluffy, and it's like these long, stringy things. No, 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 it's like a, you know, it's just like, and the pseudo goes on with, you know, uh, in the details as the pseudos do, with all of the intricacies of all the, the, you know, the people say, no, 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 this is what it's like. And they started to fight with each other. And the king, the Sutta says, and the king was gratified. The king was gratified. It's sort of like, you know, watching the gladiators fight. But, you know, it's not so different from us kind of sitting and watching the news or reading the Washington Post and reading about, you know, Democrats and the Republicans and they're fighting with each other. And we're kind of, and you can, you can kind of get that feel, don't you, of what it's like to kind of be sitting back and being gratified. You know, it's like tisk, tisk, tisk. They shouldn't be doing that. Isn't this silly? Isn't this foolish? Look at this foolish blind people. You know, why don't they kind of get along? Why don't they, you know, why doesn't the tea part, you know, whatever it is that we can kind of be gratified, first of all, in our own blindness, but we can be gratified in watching these kinds of conflicts that have arisen out of constructions. Just as this you know, the Sutta describes working with these views. And so the Buddha says, in the same way, monks, the wanderers of other sects are blind and eyeless. They don't know what is beneficial and what is harmful. They don't know what is the Dhamma and what is non-Dhamma. Now here he's not referring to, he's not saying, you know, they're, they're stupid, but he's saying, he's, he's pointing to ignorance. He's pointing to people who use Ajax to try to clean up a, a popsicle, um, you know, that it's just like, he says, they, they're, they're not, you know, Sharon, honey, sweetie, you're not understanding how this works. You're blind, honey. You need to kind of step back and look at this from a wider perspective. He says, they don't know what is the Dhamma, which is to say, the Dhamma is just a word um, well, it means a million different things, but it's a word that means basically how things work. They don't understand what is dhamma and what is non-dhamma, not knowing what is beneficial and what is harmful, not knowing what is dhamma and what is non-dhamma. They keep on arguing, quarreling, and disputing, wounding one another with weapons of the mouth, saying the dhamma is like this, it's not like that. The dhamma's not like that, it's like this. It's my understanding, actually, that on the path to awakening, to full enlightenment, that attachment clinging to views is one of the last things to go. 
you know, because even he, here he's saying we can even cling to the view of what is the true teaching of the Dhamma. And boy, it doesn't really take much Googling to find those kinds of conflicts online, to find people arguing with one another about whether this is the correct Buddhist teaching or if that's the correct Buddhist teaching. So the knives, he's talking about the sharp pointed knives that arise in our hearts. Um, he says, with regard to these things, they're attached. Some contemplatives and Brahmins, they quarrel and fight, and fight people seeing only one side. So two things. One is they're blind. They don't know what is Dhamma. They, they're ignorant. And two, they argue about it kind of from a very narrow perspective. So I want to invite you, as you think about the conflicts that you've noted, to consider the possibility that uh, you and I are blind. That we only see a part of the picture. That our job is to open, release, open, release, open to a larger view, to clear some of our own ignorance and greed and hatred. Easy for me to say. So the invitation really is to cultivate renunciation. It's really interesting, as I started to inquire into this, I've actually been studying this for some time, and some months ago I was engaged in a quite a painful conflict with a friend of mine. And when I started to read, I watched the mind go, but I'm right, you know? but I'm right, this kind of attachment and insistence. It's almost like I don't even want to engage in conflict resolution if it means I have to consider the possibility of letting go of that kind of grip on the sense that I'm right. He's wrong. I'm, I'm right. So we can kind of see. So just to kind of contemplate with some of the, you know, some of the the conflicts that you've written down, to what extent this arises. And again, there may be questions that come up. I'm sure there are. If you really reflect on it, I'm sure there are because there's so many different ways of of looking at this. So I'm going to offer just one more thing, and then I'll pick up um, the next time because I want to also offer you a little bit of time to, con- to write some questions down. Um, one more thing that um, Philip Moffat in his teaching, he said he, he found uh, when he worked with um, renunciation, he's, he found three renunciations. And I'll just read to you the first one. He says, the first renunciation is, I renounce being right about the past, present, or future. Many times you are attached to being right, and that attachment is what holds you in anger. It does not matter, Philip says, if in fact you are right. When you are attached to being right, you keep recreating conflict and anger. Okay? So I just want to pause there for just a minute to invite you to just reflect and look to see if there are any questions that you want to include. You know, can help me you know, write any further or, you know, develop any further teachings. If there's anything else that you want to include um, as a question. As the Buddha invites us to not just hear, but to bring these teachings into our bodies, into our minds.
Sure. Well, remember that, I mean, there I think it might be helpful to kind of back up even further because remember that that is the intention of the news. Nobody would watch it. If it would be like, you know, having a gladiator performance, you know. You know, if, if there was a gladiator show and you came and, every, and, you know, and everybody kind of shook hands and, you know, and you know, petted the bull and whatever, you know, whatever it was, that, you know, nobody would would come, you know, so that part of the intention, it would be like the Democratic National Committee, part of their intention was inviting me into that frame of mind. So to be kind of be aware. Now there we might consider not indeed watching the news. Yeah. The ones I don't watch. Right, right. Yeah, one of my friends went to, we were working with Bridging Separation, and she actually went to a tea party meeting, you know, with, with kind of that in mind. Can I approach it from, you know, really not having this, this fixed view? We're going to need to stop. In two weeks, I'll continue this. Um, I will be very happy to receive your questions. I want to read you one thing before we end. Um, and if you want to email me, if there's any questions that come up, feel free to do that. It's just Sharon at meta, M-E-T-T-A dot org. So feel free to...